All right, might grab your Bibles, open to Isaiah 60. I'm going to start with a verse from uh, last week from John, and that John taught out of Isaiah 59. Just kind of set the stage. Remember last night or last week he talked about, uh, you know, at the beginning of Isaiah 59 was that whole division. Really, I should do it this way: the division between God and us because of our sin. How sin separates us. From God, But in Isaiah 59, 16, he says this, he said, And he saw that there was no man, meaning God saw no man, and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm, meaning God's own arm, brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. This, this idea, and we've seen it all through Isaiah, how the, the people sin, they fall away, that God punishes and brings nations against them, but God rescues, God pulls back, God works, and then ultimately he sends the Savior, Jesus Christ. This week in Isaiah 60, we're not going to look at every detail. I mean, there are a lot of details. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about this, and, and again, last week it was, you people have sinned. This week he's speaking directly. I'll just read Isaiah 60, 14. It says, and they will call you the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. He's speaking to the city. Again, we, we've seen that at, back in Isaiah 54. Uh, the city of Jerusalem is who he's speaking to. God, through the prophet Isaiah, is speaking to the city, to Zion. Anybody pay attention to the news this week? What's going on in Jerusalem? Right now, I think got some pictures. Lower picture and lower left there is in Jerusalem. I think it's on the Temple Mount. Um, the others are in Gaza, rockets, upper right, rockets coming from Gaza to Israel. The others are Israel's retaliation and destruction. That's what's going on in this city that Isaiah is speaking of this week. It was ironic as I was preparing over the past couple weeks that this started this past week. It's amazing. In Isaiah 54, we studied a few weeks ago, it said, Shout, o, shout for joy, O barren one. You who have no child, break forth in joyful shouting. Remember that one? We talked about that, and it was talking about the city. He was preaching to the city. Rejoice. You, you, it's like you don't have any children, but you're going to have a ton. And in we looked at Galatians, how we are the children of the heavenly Jerusalem. You see all these pictures, all these imageries that are going on. In Isaiah 54, it talks about telling Jerusalem to spread it to spread out because you're going to have so many children. You, you just need to spread out. And then, and then we saw in Rome or in Revelation how it's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Some, how do, a city that big. Also in Revelation 20, verse 6, maybe you're aware of this, it talks about uh, in the first resurrection that God, Jesus Christ himself, will set up his reign for a thousand years and he'll reign for that thousand years. Now, there are tons of ideas of what this all looks like, how it all plays out, how the, what's called the millennial reign, that thousand year reign will, will, will play out. Is, some people say it's going on right now and it's really not a thousand years, it's really the church reign. Others people say, and yes, it's literal and that's the way it's gonna happen. Others have all kinds of different views, right? It is very, very difficult to take prophecy that is not yet fulfilled in and be specific and, and nail it down and say, this is the way it is. The only thing we're really confident of are the scriptures that have prophetic uh, things laid out and then we see the fulfillment. So an Old Testament uh, prophecy of Jesus, for example, and then the New Testament says this is the, the fulfillment of that. That we can be very confident of. Others, not so much. And so we look at them and we say, this might be, this could be, this, all this could work out. And that's why I bring up even today's Jerusalem. And today's Israel, does it play into all this? I don't know. I really don't. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of like it might, it should, it kind of must, it, but I don't know. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to go into this Isaiah 60. I might not pull out what you'd pull out. Okay, I'm going to pull out what I've been led to pull out. I don't, I don't know if it's by God or just by my own interest. Uh, you can gain what you, what you will from it. I think there's, there's, there's things to learn through what we're going to go through this morning, but it's not all that's in Isaiah 60. I'm not even going to read it all. 
So I encourage you, as I always do, go in and, and study it on your own. Uh, but that you'll, you'll dive into it with me. You'll either get bored, you might even get upset. I hope you get God working on you in mighty ways. Join me in prayer. Father, I, th- I do pray that you will work in us mighty way, mightily. You, you've given me a great journey as I've gone, gone over Isaiah 60. I pray, Father, for you to continue that journey in me, but also in each person here. Uh, that, that just as you have moved in men and women in the past, you've, you've stirred them. I pray you'll stir us today. Move us. Give us clear direction. Direct our steps, even as we make, you know, kind of made up plans. Direct our steps, Lord. To you be glory, even in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Through Isaiah, just kind of a little recap, through Isaiah, he he started out talking about what was going on at the time that he was there, and and specifically the the threat and then the ultimate coming of Assyria to uh, take take out Israel, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, just take them out, they're gone. But also to besiege Jerusalem, but then they would fall back. Assyria would fall back, and then eventually Assyria would go away to Babylon, and then Babylon would come. This is the prophetic part of Isaiah. Babylon would come and take out the southern kingdom of Judah, and they would go into exile. But also in the prophecy, there's the return from Israel. And he specifically, or from, from Babylon, excuse me, and, and he specifically uh, mentions a king by name, Cyrus, the king of Persia that will eventually take out Babylon. You see how he's just going history, and he's laying out what's going to happen in that. Um, but it also talks about the eternal kingdom. That's why I brought up the millennial kingdom, that thousand years before the forever time, you know, because it, some of those come up as well. It's, it's an amazing book. Isaiah is, has a lot of things in it. In Isaiah 60, we're going to look at four things out of this. I'm going to look at light. I'm going to look at history. I'm going to look at some things that are not yet. And then we're going to say, so what? (laughs) So what do we do with all this? And that may be whether you feel halfway through. So why are we talking about this? All right, uh, we'll we'll kind of wrap it up at the end. So Isaiah 60, verse 1, just the first three verses, he starts out. He says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Okay, so he's talking about a place. We know that because we read on later on. So he's talking about this city. He's talking about a place, but he's also saying that light has come to you. But all the nations, all the world around is darkness. And they're going to come to your light. Okay, and we know from prior scriptures that have been laid out, that light is Jesus Christ. We can look at the Gospel of John and we can see the same thing. It, the light came into the darkness, right? But the darkness did not comprehend it, is what is said in the first part of John. So we know that, that God has given that light. We, we can look back historically and say, Jesus is that light and he's come. Psalm 43, I, I love this. Listen to this. Psalm 43, 3 says, Oh, send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your holy dwelling places. So it's, it's an interesting when we start thinking physical or is it spiritual and you start, it, he helps us with physical pictures. And I'll just say that. The physical pictures help us to kind of grab a hold of some of the, what he's talking about. Colossians 1.13 this is, again, an important piece of all this, because there, there's so much information even in Isaiah 60 and what it touches. I'll try to bring a few things. Colossians 1.13, for he rescued us. And we're not talking about Jews here. We're talking about us, you and me. He rescued us from the domain of darkness. Okay, do you see that? In, in Isaiah 60, there's, there's this center place, this place called Zion, and it's light. His light has come there, but everywhere else is darkness. And he has rescued us from this domain of darkness. He's brought us into it. He's transferred us to this kingdom of his beloved son. And the kingdom is a key word here. Okay, so think about that. And use that as a, a foundation for the rest of this morning. I want to dive a little bit into history. Uh, Babylon happened. Okay, so Isaiah is talking about it in the future, but it actually happened in our past. And so... Um, Babylon comes and does destroy Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. That first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. Okay, just historical fact. 
In Isaiah 60, verse 10, if you want to look at that, Isaiah 60, verse 10, it says, Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Okay, don't miss this. All the way through Isaiah, it's God is punishing the nation of Israel. Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, Judah, the southern kingdom. He's just punishing them because of their sin. I mean, it's very clear all through Isaiah. But he does not lose his heart for them. It's totally clear. And he says that here. He says, I, in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. But notice at the beginning of this passage, he says, foreigners will build up your walls. Remember, they've all been torn down. Everything, walls, temple, everything, city been totally destroyed by the Babylonians. And he says, foreigners will build up your walls. Pro prophecy past the prophecy, if you will. Pro uh, prophecy there. If you've read the, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you know that this happens. I'm going to read just a little bit in Ezra 1. And, and again, you can... Uh, do some more reading. Ezra chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse, so at the end of verse 1, it says, The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a house for him in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all the people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Okay, so here's the king of Persia. Persia overtakes Babylon. And God has already predestined it to say Cyrus is going to uh, be favorable towards rebuilding this, specifically here in Ezra, the temple. Right? And you see it all laid out. And he's calling people... People who have been taken into exile, he's going to say, hey, go back and build this. I'm going to go on to Ezra 1, 5. He says this, Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose. Every, and take note of this. Everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord. Does that make sense? Something is happening in Cyrus. So God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. But he's also stirring up the people. Right, you get that? Powerful thing. Now that's about the temple itself, and that's historical. You can look back and it happened in our past. Nehemiah is also there, written in the scripture, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, also of Jeremiah. The different king, though, King Artaxerxes, this is chapter 2, Nehemiah. Uh, king Artaxerxes, in verse 4, it says, Then the king said to me, What would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, If it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. So it pleased the king to send me. And I gave him a definite time. Okay, I'm going to jump down to verse 8. And a letter, the king gave a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give timber and beams and gates for the fortress, which is, in the temp or which is by the temple. For the wall in the city and the house that I, where I go. And the king granted them to me because the ha good hand of my God was on me. Okay? All clear. God's working in this. He moved Nehemiah. He, he, if you look at the prior chapter, he moved him to grief over the state of, of uh, the city of Jerusalem. Even though the, the temple was being built, he, it was still the city was in ru ruins and they were a disgrace put in his heart even to ask the king. But God was working in the king as well. And you see, see how that works. Now, what I notice in these two chapters, or these two books, Ezra and Nehemiah, especially coming off of Isaiah 60, is God is doing something clear, right? We read that in 59, where God is the savior of this whole thing. But he does something in people. And what I see is there's kind of miracles and muscle, if you want to say it that way. There's the miracle of God. God's doing a work. But then there's people responding to something being stirred inside of them by God. And then they do it. Whether it be the king to issue an edict, 
Or it be Ezra to gather people. Or Nehemiah to have a plan. And he goes secretly, oh, by himself. He's thinking about himself. And then he gathers people to actually do the work. And you see it actually get done. But remember, if you know the story of Nehemiah, they're building the wall with swords in their hands because of the attacks of the enemies that are going on at the time. You see what I'm getting at? That, that there, is, there is God's blessing, but it's a lot of times, here's a lot of times when I look at like the, 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 the city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, I go, oh, you know, and it just, it just happens. And then I look at these stories and I'm like, wait a minute, God's doing this, but, but it's not without struggle. Now, is that the way it will be? I, I don't know. But is it possible that some of this struggle is actually part of what he's laying out in, Jerusalem, in, in Revelation? I don't know. It, it's, but it, you see how, it, how the, the pictures of the way it was and, and trying to figure out how it will be can, can challenge you in both ways. One, you can stay back here and say, this is the only way it is. Or you can kind of throw it off and say, no, it's totally just bliss. These are, these are challenging things. And because really what we're getting at is, where do we fit in all this? Where does this time fit in? All right, let's move ahead 500 years plus. Right? If you take the time of, of the Babylonian return, up about 500 years, you're at Jesus. All right? Here's, so in, in, in Isaiah 60, verse 6, it says this. It says, A multitude of camels will cover you, and young camel, camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come, and will bring gold and frankincense, and will bear good news of the praises of, of the Lord. I'm sorry, I used the word frankincense, so I have to think of Jesus' birth, right? I have to think of the Magi. I, I don't know if that's what it's talking about. I mean, camels, I looked through the New Testament. I mean, you guys all know the stories, the, the Christmas stories. They all have camels, right? All the, all the wise men are riding on camels, right? It's not in Matthew. It's not, I, I haven't found it. Maybe you guys can find it in the New Testament where they were riding on camels. I couldn't find it. Is this a prophecy of that? I don't know. I mean, I mean Sheba, or Midian and Ephah, basically it's Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, Sheba is kind of down towards Ethiopia. It's more south than east, where the guys came from. You, you see what I'm getting at? I don't know exactly how to handle some of these passages. But I do know historically that after the Babylonian return, and, and they, they, uh, they built the temple back up, we get up and we get in history and we find Jesus is there, which are clearly prophecies of other parts of Isaiah. Clearly. 53, for example. What happens right after Jesus? Jesus dies, he ascends to heaven, his apostles go out, and in 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed again. And the temple is destroyed. The second temple is destroyed Again, by the Romans this time. It's, it's an amazing history. And I want you to bring you up to 1930, 1940. Things change again. Uh, in Isaiah 60, verse 9, it says this, Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Now, ships of Tarshish, there's a, there's a city on the southern part of Spain, on the Atlantic side, that's Tarshish, is known today. That might be the Tarshish they're talking about. They could just be talking about trade ships. And some have said it's not just to the west, but also to the east, to the orient, down through the water there. I don't, I'm not, I don't know my geography all that well. I always have to look at a map. But the, you see what I'm getting there t Some people talk like that. But you know, when we talk about the return from Babylon, there wouldn't be any need for ships. Right? Because they're just over in Iraq. And the only water they got across is the Jordan River. So what is he talking about here? About the sons being brought back from afar on ships. Well, maybe 1930 to 1940 fits this. I, I don't know. In, in 1937 to 1947, approximately 64 ships were used to bring uh, Jewish people, Jewish descendant people, from the um, concentration camps and displacement in all of Europe. They were gathered into displaced person camps, what we call refugee camps today. 
They were gathering those all over France, all over Europe, and various places. And they, they didn't have a home. The Jews didn't have a place to go. And they, many of them wanted to go to Palestine, what was called British Palestine at the time. Now what's interesting is this really began back in 1897, called the Zionist Movement. And in, in the Zionist Movement, it was basically in Russia. Have you ever seen The Fiddler on the Roof? That's the beginning, if you will, of the Zionist Movement. The Russians were persecuting Jews, Jews trying to continue, to, what, as the song is, they're trying to live out their traditions. And the Russians were oppressing them, and, they were, and out of that came a Zionist movement, and they said, we want to be a country of our own. We want to get back to Israel. Okay? Well, back in the 30s, all the persecution that goes on through uh, Hitler and lots of other places, I mean, it started in Russia, but it went beyond that. And there was a, an organization, Haganah, was birthed out of the Zionist movement physically fighting against the Brit British to try to tear down the British rule in, in Palestine. It didn't work. They knew that wouldn't work. So they tried a different tact. What they tried to do is get just, just uh, send a flood of Jews into Israel, and there'd be so many people there, hundreds of thousands, then they'd be able to form their own nation. Okay? That was their plan. And they used ships, like this one called the Exodus uh, 1947. Now, what was interesting... Um, and I want to bring this up really important. You saw those pictures of Israel today, and if you watch the news over the past week, or if you go out and watch the news now, the news will persuade you on how to look at what's going on. Okay? If you hear a pro-Israel side, you'll say, wow, they're just responding to what the Palestinians did. If you hear, if you hear a pro-Palestinian viewpoint, you'll say, wow, those Jews are terrible. Why are they persecuting and beating up on these poor people? What I'm getting at is the, the, the journalism will influence you. That's what happened with this boat right here. There's a, boat, a book written uh, by Ruth Gruber um, that laid out all what happened. She was published in a lot of places. So this was brought... You know what happened on this boat? The 4,500 people, including... Where's, where's Becca? Pregnant women. I, think that, I heard word that there were several babies born on this boat. Okay, just in the week that it went there, and then it got him, it was a mess. Basically, they went towards Palestine. British um, blockade stopped them by ramming their warships against the side of this boat. That's why it's all beat up right there. Right? And finally boarded it. It was a violent boarding. They, these guys fought back. The, the British fought. Uh, there was an American, this is a, basically an American crew, by the way, so, wait, this is an American ship. Uh, it was purchased out of a scrap heap. It was um, manned by American Jews who uh, did not necessarily know how to go, to go to sea. One of the American crewmen was killed during the occupation of that. Basically, the, the British then took it to port in Israel, took the people off, put them on other boats, and took them back where they came from, to France. In France, the French said, you can get off if you want to, but you don't have to. Only maybe 19 people got off the boat. Why? Because on the shores and in boats around, on loudspeakers, the Haganah, organized Zionists, were saying, don't get off the boat, stay on the boat, stay on the boat, stay on the boat. And they did. 4,500 people stayed on the boat. Well, then in there, they wouldn't get off, and the, and the British were getting tired of this. And so what they did is they took these people to other camps in Germany. These people had been in concentration camps of the Germans, freed, put in uh, displaced people's camps in France and other places. They escaped there and went by what we would call the Underground Railroad to get to the coast, to get on boats, to go to Palestine, and now the British are taking them to Germany to put them in camps run by Germans. Now again, this is all in the news and the news is spinning it, right? That is a big player in why Israel is a nation today. There was a, there was a Methodist minister on this boat who got a, a, a speech capability to be able to speak in front of the, the uh, UN, and he's powerful because he was not Jewish, but he was a Christian uh, Zionist, if you will. Now. Why am I saying all this stuff? I want to, I want to focus on a few people. I want, why would you get on this boat? 
4,500 people got on this boat, including men, women, children, and pregnant women. Why would you get on this boat? Why would, you, why would you listen to a leadership of an organization that you have never met? There's no, there's no government. There's, it's just a bunch of people calling out for things. Why would you do that? Hope, right? There's got to be some kind of hope. Now, they're in desperate situation, too. They don't have a home. They don't, they, they're not free. They're in these camps. They don't know where they belong. They're in desolate situations. Could these scriptures have something to do with it? I suspect they did. I mean, all, most of the reading I did was like PBS and stuff like that, so I didn't get that thought. I read some of the Jewish history just to make sure I got some of the information right. Um, but the scripture had to be there. There was one guy that I saw him speaking, and he was talking about how God had done this. Okay, and he, even, even raising up the British leader that sent him to Germany that got public opinion on their side. It, it's just an amazing story. It's probable that they did not have, they were not just looking out for themselves. They were not just looking out for, oh, I want to have a better life. Is it possible, and, and again, I, I don't know all these answers, is it possible they were kingdom-minded? That they were looking for a homeland of their own. They may not have had all the king, that Jesus and God is the king in their minds, but did they have a kingdom mindset? One thing I know, just by reading and watching some of this, they, they were courageous. And, and through my study in this week, I read Revelation 21, verse 8. And, and in this, it, it talks about uh, all these people who end up in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. And it, and it starts out this way. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death, I always skipped the cowardly. I, I never looked at cowardice in that list. And I wonder if we are far too comfortable and far too cowardly and far little kingdom-minded in our, our personal lives and us as a church. I know we've talked about it a lot, and, and I do. I, I think about these things a lot, and I preach about these things a lot, but I wonder at times if I and us are not missing some things. Let's go on, because we're not there yet. Let's go on to that part, because you look at this history. We're here today. There's a millennial kingdom in front of us. There's an eternal kingdom in front of us. Let me read Isaiah 60, verses 17 through 22. And I will make peace your administers and righteousness your overseers. Violence will not be heard again in your land. Therefore, today's Israel is not fully fulfilled. If, it's any, if it has anything to do with what is being written here in, in Isaiah 60, it's definitely not there yet. Clear? <laughs> the stuff of this past week is, makes that evidently clear. Okay? Violence will not be heard in your, in your land, nor devastation, destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor brightness for the moon, uh, for, uh, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. And your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. And the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one will be a clan, the least will be a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Now, in this, keep in mind he's speaking to the city, but he refers to the people. Do you see that? The, the people, in the, in the blessing of the city, the people of the city are also blessed. It's powerful stuff. Now, if you know anything about Revelation, do you, you hear it? I mean, it's like, was... was uh, 
John, the Apostle John, just quoting Isaiah when he wrote some of, of Revelation? But no, because remember, John saw a vision of it. So it was a new revelation, if you will, to John. I, I, I want you to go there. Revelation chapter 21. We'll just pull a few of the things out of there. Just to show you that, that I'm not making it up. This, this is the same stuff. That somewhere out in our future that is not here yet, clearly not here yet, somewhere out in our future, God has a glorious, glorious future that we long for, that they longed for. And it keeps going. Revelation chapter 21, I'll just start in verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, for the first things have passed away. Jump down to verse 9. It says, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal, clear jasper. Jump down to 16. The city was laid out as square. It talks about the size of it. Jump down to 21. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations, get this, the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night there. The, the gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination or lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is a glorious place for those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that exciting? Doesn't it create a, a longing? That's what, what a lot of the scripture is talking about. That you see it historically, a physical longing, but, but we're there too. Where is, where is this kingdom? And do we have a kingdom mindset? Because that, that's really what, where I'm at now is, is, so what? So what we've read all this stuff? So what all this stuff is there? So what this prophecy of some eternal kingdom coming out, and I don't know how it all works out, so what? How do we practice? How do we participate with God today, here in Manhattan, Kansas in 2021? How, how do we learn from Ezra and Nehemiah? Do, do, is it possible that you can be stirred up in your spirit, like Nehemiah was, and you come up with a plan, a, a way to, to do the work of God somehow, and you'll gather people together? Or maybe you'll be one of those simple people just living life and being willing to be led by somebody who has the Spirit guiding him. How's it look? How did it look at Nehemiah before he talked to the king? You ever thought about that? What was he doing kingdom-mindedly before he spoke to the king? Here, king, here's your wine with a happy countenance. Remember? If you read that, he, he's just serving the king, his wine. That's, he was just a wine bearer, cup bearer. That, the point I'm getting at is... is a lot of what walking with Christ is, is just walking in life, just doing life. It doesn't have to be some great grandiose thing, getting on some boat and sacrificing yourself. But it might be. It, it might be going to some foreign land. It might be talking to that scary neighbor. It might be something like that. But mostly it's just day-to-day -day living. Look at this, some of these passages. Hebrews chapter 12, 22 through 24 it says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. And I'll go down to 28. It says, therefore, okay, so since all these things are like this, and you've come here, which is why you guys are here, 
You're all coming to God through vintage faith, through, through doing what you're doing today. You're coming to God for that purpose. Since you've come to this, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. You ever thought about that? Wow, the way I can walk with God is just be great, grateful. It is. It's not, it doesn't have to be some grandiose thing. Just walk in gratitude. He says, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So we're, 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 we're living in this kingdom in this life, and we're grateful, and then service comes out of that. Service of works of something comes out of it. But it begins with coming to God. It, it continues with gratitude, and it goes on. Matthew 5, 16. How about this one? Let your light so shine. Like a city set on a hill, right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Is your, is your good works going to get you into that book? No. But that being in that book, being a part of this kingdom, even though it's not fully here yet, produces things in us. And, and it's Ezra 1, 5. Everyone whose spirit God has stirred, has God stirred in your spirit somehow? This morning, yesterday, a year ago, tomorrow? Is there something God's stirring in you right now? That's how He worked back then. That's how He works now. His Spirit stirring your spirit to, to respond to His Word, His way, to change your path to get on His. Change your attitude, your heart. Let Him transform it. Let Him get in there and do a work. So often we resist that. No, God, I don't want to. When God is stirring in you, go with it. Go with it. Check it. Make sure it's His Spirit. Sure. But don't quench it. Isaiah 61, 3 says, 1 says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for these scriptures. Thank you for the history that's all here, but also this mysterious future that's still out in front of us. Lord God, I, I humble myself before you by these words, knowing that I am a coward in many ways. I'm comfortable and I'm, I've in many ways um, hindered your spirit to allow you to move me. Lord, I repent, I confess. I, I don't know necessarily what you're doing in me or each one, but I personally submit myself to you. And Lord, I, I submit, <laughs> I am gonna lay them out before you too. I pray for those who are here right now that you'll just work in each of us to your glory and honor and to the good of us too and to your kingdom forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.